Hello, my name is Kimberly Adden, and I'm here today to talk about how my sister has shaped my future. When Kayla was two and a half years old, she was diagnosed with PDD-NOS, which stands for Pervasive Developmental Disorder Not Otherwise Specified. She was diagnosed in the 90s, which was a time where there were a variety of sub-diagnoses under the category of autism. And since then, these have been combined together. So if Kayla were diagnosed today, she'd be diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Now, I'm often asked what it's like to have a sister who has autism. And I find that in a casual conversation or with somebody new, it's easier to just tell a quick funny story about my sister rather than dig into some of the tougher parts of having a sister who has autism. In these casual conversations, that's really all anyone cares to hear anyway. So with that being said, here's one of my go-to Kayla stories. It's well known that individuals who have autism have a tendency to get stuck in certain routines and can have some pretty serious meltdowns if these routines are disrupted. Over the years, my family and I have learned to pick and choose our battles. And when it comes to Kayla's TV routine, we don't mess with that. But that's resulted in us getting stuck in a lot of interesting TV routines over the years. For example, for a period of time that lasted way longer than any of us could have possibly anticipated, every Saturday afternoon, at the same time, we would watch the Magic Bullet infomercial. <laughs> that's right, an infomercial, the same one every single week for years. It was driving us crazy. We had all essentially memorized the commercial after the first year of this, and we would joke that all hell would break loose in our house if they ever stopped showing it, and fortunately, Kayla got tired of it before that happened. At a certain point, my parents thought it might be a good idea to buy this blender for my sister, since she had shown so much interest in the commercial. And with that, at that time, Kayla was receiving occupational therapy services. And one of her goals was to increase the variety of foods she was eating. So my parents thought if we buy this blender, Kayla might be more interested in trying smoothies or avocados or some of the other foods featured in the commercial. I distinctly remember Kayla's confusion that Christmas morning when she unwrapped that blender. She had no interest in the actual product system. To this day, it still sits somewhere in our kitchen cabinets, barely used. Now, I've realized more recently that Kayla's tendency to get stuck in these TV routines is why I really have very little interest in TV and movies today, which always surprises people when they learn that about me, because I'm a college student. I'm supposed to be able to binge watch Netflix for hours on end, but I don't have the attention span for it. And I think it's because when you grow up in a house where a change in the TV routine requires two weeks notice, a family meeting, permission from Kayla and still ends in a meltdown, you don't get the chance to explore TV and movies the same way other people do, which is probably why my Netflix queue only has two suggested shows and my boyfriend keeps an ever-expanding list of movies I need to watch to catch up with the rest of the universe. These are just some of the quirky things that happen when you grow up with a sister who has autism. So when somebody asks me what it's like to have Kayla as my sister, I'll tell that story, or one of countless other stories that I save up for these moments. The truth is, though, there are also a lot of tough parts of having a sister who has autism, and I don't tend to share these with other people as readily. But I'm here today to open up to you all about some of those experiences and let you into my world of having a sister who has autism. Growing up, there would be countless different professionals coming in and out of our house, bringing toys and games to work with my sister. It was explained to me at the time that they were there because Kayla has autism, but I didn't understand what that meant. I was a toddler. So I thought, maybe it's an age thing, and eventually it'd be my turn. And when I realized that that wasn't the case, I started to copy some of Kayla's behaviors to try to get some of that attention. But this just resulted in me getting shooed away and being told that I needed to not bother Kayla while she's working, which was the start of me internalizing a lot of really tough emotions. It's really difficult to put into words the suffocating pressure that I'd felt from the first spelling tests of elementary school through my high school advanced placement exams that I needed to be perfect, that I needed to get a 100% on everything. 
Somehow, I had assigned myself the job of making up for my sister's deficits, and this led to a lot of bad habits and poor coping skills that I've had to work really hard as a college student to undo. When you grow up with a sibling who has a disability, there are a lot of really big ideas that you have to process at a young age, and I felt very alone in having these. For example, as early as elementary school, I had an acute understanding that down the road, if something happened to my parents, Kayla would become my responsibility. And that's a responsibility my future husband would have to share as well. I was 10 years old and afraid of falling in love because I didn't know if I'd be able to find someone who loves my sister as much as I do. This has impacted me so much so that it took me nearly five years into my current relationship to bring this up to my boyfriend. And even though I know that he loves my sister and respects my obligations to her, I broke down in tears just bringing up the subject because that 10-year-old is still inside of me and she's still scared for her future sometimes. I've learned over the years that my family operates very differently from other families. Within our household, a lot of time and attention is put into finding services for Kayla, advocating for Kayla, helping Kayla, and all the while putting up this facade that things are running smoothly, especially on the days when they really aren't. There are a lot of unspoken emotions that rule over the actions that individuals within my family take, and a lot of this has to do with a feeling of guilt. There's a feeling of guilt because there's no way to evenly split time and attention and resources. When Kayla was in school, there was a feeling of guilt with trying to navigate the special education system, which is very confusing and intimidating in this country. My parents would come home from those meetings and argue sometimes. Maybe if we said this instead of that, we could have done something more. There's a sense of guilt associated with going to work for the day, or going away to college, or sometimes just getting out of the house for the afternoon because self-care is being falsely equated with selfishness. And please don't misinterpret my words. I love my sister endlessly and will do anything for her. And I know my parents feel the same way. And this just makes us feel even more guilty on the days when we aren't our best versions of ourselves. It's taken me years to unpack these emotions and memories and learn to love myself and my family. And I am grateful for the progress I've made with this. The truth is, we all have our good days and our bad days, and that doesn't make any of us less valuable as human beings. My sister is certainly no exception to that rule. Kayla might not remember all the social rules of a conversation, but she's incredible at painting nails and can tell you the names of every color of OPI nail polish, which is her favorite brand. <laughs> Kayla might not make eye contact with you, but she has a sense of humor that will sneak up on you and knock you off your feet. Kayla might have issues with adjusting to unexpected changes in her routine, but for the past three years, she's been working as an office assistant, and I am so incredibly proud of her. Kayla is a fashionista, a dancing queen, a diva, and truly the best person to take clothing shopping with you because she won't hold back on telling you that she doesn't like your outfit. <laughs> I had to FaceTime her to get permission to wear this ridiculous yellow today. <laughs> So with all of that being said, there's a huge misconception that I'd like to clear up today. Through considering my experiences, the experiences of other families like mine, and the current research, it's clear that we need to do more to support families raising a child who has autism. There have been a variety of studies that have begun to consider this. For example, a study in 2006 sought to consider the maternal self-efficacy in mothers raising a child who has autism. And in this study, 40% of the mothers indicated that they were experiencing signs and symptoms of depression. 63% of the mothers in this study indicated that they had very high levels of parenting stress. And 80% of the mothers in this study indicated that they had feelings of guilt over a perception that they weren't able to do enough for their child who has autism. Research has also considered the experiences of fathers. A study in 2013 sought to consider the lived experiences of fathers navigating the special education system. And I found that while I was conducting this research, it was really challenging to find articles that focused exclusively on the experiences of fathers. There's significantly more research available considering the experiences of mothers. But in this study, all 131 fathers indicated that they felt as though they were the odd man out or some other version of that phrase. 
They felt as though during these special education meetings, the conversation was only being directed towards their wives, and they weren't able to effectively contribute to this team dynamic. Research has also considered the experiences of siblings within this. A study in 2016 sought to consider the anxiety and depression symptomology in adult siblings of individuals with a variety of developmental disabilities compared to adults who don't have a sibling who has a disability. And in this study, the adult siblings of individuals with autism had among the highest levels of anxiety and depression. These are just three of many studies that indicate this need for increasing the support available to families raising a child who has autism. This is an emerging area of research, but I've been aware of this my whole life. The current system doesn't adequately support families like mine. Over the years, I've participated in different support groups, both online and in person, formal and informal. And while it's nice to know that I'm part of this global community of siblings who face the same challenges that I do, this is just not enough. And so that brings me to my big idea for the future. My big idea for the future is to revolutionize the way that we consider providing support for families raising a child who has autism from both a clinical and a societal perspective. From a clinical perspective and using my knowledge in occupational therapy, I've developed a new therapeutic model for providing this support. My therapeutic model consists of two branches. The ability services branch, which is the traditional therapeutic services that a child who has autism receives, and the family services branch, which consists of specific targeted mental health interventions for the family raising that child. My therapeutic model fits well into the current outpatient service delivery model that exists in the United States today. Within this outpatient model, families will bring their child to a clinic and sit in the waiting room while the child is receiving those services. My model pulls these families out of the waiting room and into the clinic so they can receive these services that they need. I'd like to break down the family services component of my therapeutic model into a little bit more detail. The services provided by occupational therapy are going to consist of specific intervention groups aimed at individual roles within the family unit. So a group for siblings might focus on assertiveness training, which is a skill that empowers and enables an individual to use their voice to have their needs heard. And a group for fathers might focus on co-occupation, which is a term used within occupational therapy to represent a meaningful activity that's shared between two or more individuals. And this will help to counteract the data that suggests that these fathers feel left out. The psychology component of my therapeutic model will be run by licensed marriage and family therapists, providing a variety of services, including individual counseling, marriage counseling, and family sessions, depending on what that individual family needs. And the social work component of my model will consist of a variety of information and counseling services available to the family. When you have a child who's been newly diagnosed with a disability, suddenly there's a whole new vocabulary of services and laws and interventions that these families need to become familiar with very quickly in order to effectively advocate for their child. And learning about all these resources and all of this information is a huge cause of stress for these families. So this component of my therapeutic model aims to reduce that stress through providing families with that information. Ultimately, my therapeutic model of combining comprehensive therapeutic services for the family with comprehensive uh, mental health services for, will result in increased positive outcomes for the full family unit. This is an inclusion-focused model, which will result in families that can communicate more effectively and relate more positively to each other. My therapeutic model will result in family environments with less stress, which will be more conducive for supporting the development of social skills in the child who has autism. And most importantly, through reducing the stress that these families experience, my therapeutic model will result in families that are more open about their experiences, which will help to break down the stigma that exists within our society against autism. Ultimately, the philosophy that's guided the development of my therapeutic model can be used by each of you listening to this TED Talk. We all can play a crucial role in supporting the mental health of those around us. And according to the CDC, one out of every 59 children in the United States has been diagnosed with autism, meaning there are a lot of individuals who can use the support, and it's likely that each of you listening can think of somebody impacted by what I've discussed. If you know somebody who has a family member who has autism, engage them in conversation and be an active listener. 
and remind them that it's okay for them to have days when they aren't their best versions of themselves. This informal support can have such a stronger impact than you would ever know. And while this informal support isn't a replacement for the services that I've discussed, this informal support is crucial for empowering individuals to know that they are worthy of having their voice heard and their story told. In my future, I will change the conversation about autism spectrum disorder through creating communities where families like mine can live with a little less stress, a little less guilt, and significantly more adaptive capacities. I am passionate about leading this change, and I know that my education in occupational therapy has prepared me to do so. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.